being a student of Trzynska, a PhD student from Kensington University. Just a second. Uh -huh. My name is Justyna Pierzyńska. I'm a PhD student um, in the Department of Modern Languages in Helsinki University. And I originally come from Poland. And today I would like to talk um, a little bit with you about part of my project, my PhD project, which is um, dedicated to mapping different discourses that are used in the Polish media not only Polish media, I'm also doing Serbian media, but today I will talk about Polish media, how they represent the Caucasus, and in particular Georgia, and how they construct Georgians and Georgia, and what are the ideological elements of this discourse. And what I'm mainly interested in, in my research, is how history is used to legitimize as a specific way of talking, of making sense of Georgia and the Georgians, how it is manipulated in, with, and how it is sometimes invented from scratch, or yes, I would say invented. And um, here you can see different logos of organizations that in Poland somehow deal with Georgia. I have indicated in my abstract that there is a plethora of organizations in Poland that deal with Georgia, uh, Georgian-Polish relations, Georgian-Polish cooperation, and <coughs> they are quite influential. Georgia is a very fashionable topic in Poland. Also fashionable, not only in the political sense, but also a fashionable tourist destination. So it is uh, there is very much material about Georgia in the Polish media, in the <coughs> Polish internet, and these associations, NGOs, clubs, and different organizations, they are very active. So there are many festivals of Georgian culture. They maintain, um, for example, websites about Georgian history, uh, Georgian culture, and there is always some kind of a political element on these websites and in the comments, in the news, because I work with news material from the internet and with blogs, blogs of these NGOs and, and organizations. And um, this discourse of a special relationship between Georgia and Poland, not only uh, between the states, but also between the nations, of this community of the national spirit. And this is not present only on the level of these clubs and associations, but also on the highest level of politics and government. Uh, this is a, a, news, a photo taken from a news item which reports a so-called study visit of a Georgian delegation to the Center of, for Eastern Studies in Warsaw. This center, this is a state-funded institution, kind of a think tank that deals with the Eastern policy in Poland. And there are many, many reciprocal visits like that. So in the news you have many reports of Georgian, Georgian's delegation coming to Poland, Polish delegation going to Georgia, and this cooperation is very active. And one important element of this discourse, as long as our late president, Lech Kaczynski, was still alive, was his legendary friendship with the former Georgian president, Saakashvili. And this friendship was legendary. Why? Because it was made legendary by the media. It was very much forced in the media. And when Kaczynski died in the plane crash in Russia, it was Saakashvili that was very often interviewed by the Western media as some kind of insider to the Polish politics, expert on Poland. And he was <coughs> the one who was, for example, for example, advancing the theory that these are Russians that stand behind the plane catastrophe, plane crash in which uh, Kaczynski died. And after his death, one would have, uh, would have uh, th thought that this forcing of Georgia, this passion for Georgia and the Polish media will somehow diminish, but it did not really happen. 
because what you see here are new presidents. This is Mother Galashvili and this is Komorovsky. And this is also taken from a news item which uh, reports how the president with their wives drink a toast for the freedom and independence of Georgia. Toast is a very important thing in the Georgian culture. So they are drinking a toast for that. Um, I have so far um, identified four main ways of how the media, not only the media, also the public sphere, how people talk and make sense uh, of Georgia. So we have this historical discourse that operates on the surface of, of historical events, uh, and I call it brothers in arms, because it's centered on the alliance of these two countries and two nations against Russia, which is the ultimate other in this whole discursive construction. So we have the political element, very, very important here, the common enemy, which makes this whole thing possible. Because uh, my suggestion is that there would be no point Georgian alliance if, if it was not for Russia. This is another developmental discourse which is not important today, but it is very interesting in itself, but I will not be talking about it today. And there is an element that permeates all of these different ways of making sense of Georgia, and this is this orientalizing factor. So on one hand, Georgia is um, um, a friend, an ally, a country which is very close to Poland, but on the other, it also stands for the East, it stands for the otherness, exoticity, and by bringing this orientalizing element into the discourse, it makes it more interesting for the readership, for the audience, audiences. Because non-stop uh, reading in the news only about parallels in Georgian-Polish history, in Georgian-Polish culture, uh, would not be very influential. But by bringing this thing, this orientalizing component, you can make it more interesting. And this, uh, for example, Fairclough says that where you need such kind of uh, interdiscursivity. This is an indicator that some ideological work is also taking place um, here. So this mixing of these courses um, is important. And these uh, are the main structural elements of this brothers in arms narrative. There is an ideology um, of Prometheism which is being revived. This ideology, this was a political project from the 1920s, so old and forgotten, but now revived again. And uh, the goal here was to destabilize the Soviet Union by supporting the non-Russian uh, republics of the Soviet Union, supporting the um, independence movements in these republics. And the idea was that this will weaken the Soviet Union. So this is again present in the discourse. Next problematic things. This is the claim that there are some historical features and also shared cultural features um, between Georgia and Poland. And these shared historical features always appear in plural, so as if there were many. But there is in fact only one historical feature that is non-stop being mentioned, and this is the Russian oppression, or the Soviet oppression, that these countries were being exposed to at some point in time. The shared cultural features is, I think, the most problematic uh, claim, because uh, Poland and Georgia are quite distant countries, and this is really very uh, hard to find some shared cultural features. So notions are, like for example, love for freedom are involved. So we are the country, with the Poles love freedom, they love freedom as well, so we have a shared cultural feature. And the most, uh, the most um, common way of, of uh, legitimizing these claims uh, is, to, is to the strategy of recontextualization. So you take some symbolic events, uh, very important events from Polish history that shape Polish national identity and just add a Georgian element to them. So you enrich them by a Georgian element. And what you get 
is a Georgian-Polish symbolic event that legitimizes your discourse. And of course, the common enemy in Russia is, is cannot be left out. And um, here there is, I want to show you an example of how it um, is realized on the uh, level of language. Uh, so this is a statement of goals of the so-called Promethean Club of Georgia's Friends. And they are saying in their statement that they deal as a club with the brotherly nation of Georgia. And this brotherly nation of Georgia, this is repeated in this text in every second sentence, very much over lexicalized. Then in the second citation, they are trying to um, show um, or to explain where the name comes from. And they say, our name symbolically invokes the common Polish-Georgian traditions. Well, this is not elaborated upon at all. Also, uh, they are, are not saying what this uh, name really refers to. No mention of the Promethean project and uh, the ideology behind it. And then we have the perennial friendship and similarity of historical experiences shared culture and economic interests. And I would, like to draw, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that only economic interest is something that can be uh, concretely named. This is energy policy and security. Historical experience and shared culture cannot really be defined. Very important thing in this discourse, the quest for continuity. Because if we build a discourse, uh, if we claim a shared culture, then, then we need some kind of continuity. And this is Georgian ambassador uh, to Poland who says, until recently, we believed that our diplomatic relations date from 1992. But now we know that they date, in fact, from 1920. So this gives us 70 additional years of discontinuity that we are so much in need of if we want to legitimize our claims. This snapshot was taken from film, a documentary film about a small contingent of uh, Georgian officers who were serving in the Polish army in the 1920s. And this film uh, is entitled Very a Four-Cornered Cap and a Tiger Skin. What is a four-cornered cap? This is a Polish traditional cap, worn by, Pol worn by Polish soldiers, soldiers up until today. And the Tiger Skin, this is of course a symbol for the Georgian knight. So combining these elements together gives us a new entity, this Polish-Georgian brotherhood. There are also more funny ways to legitimize the discourse. For example, there are word plays. This is a proverb that uh, stems from the 17th of 18th century. This proverb is uh, very well known in children at school, and this, here you have the English translation, and it claims that Poles and Hungarians are cousins. And it is enough to replace the word Hungarian with the word Georgia, and we have a new proper. <laughs> that Poles and Georgians are cousins. And in fact, this proverb was so much forced in the media, this is a very good headline. So this was a headline for many articles. And, um, People really starting to uh, ridicule it. For example, this photograph was circulating on the internet uh, using hyperlink, saying, well, now we have the new national truth. We, and Poles and Georgians are cousins. Um, and here, what is important here is this orientalizing element. This is a book cover. The book is entitled The Unknown Georgia, Shared Fortunes of Poles and Georgians. So a contradiction you can see already in the title. On the one hand, Georgia is unknown. On the other hand, there are shared fortunes, shared culture, shared history. And in fact, these guys here are not unknown. They are very easily recognizable, apart from this one. I did not identify them. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is an advertisement uh, of the publishing house that advertises this book. And it says, this is a publication that brings to light the last 100 years of common fortunes, history, and loyal friendship. The uh, history of Georgians who were murdered in the cutting forest. So here you have this recontextualization at work, a very important symbolic historical event 
of the Polish history is taken and enriched by a Georgian element, and we receive a Polish Georgian symbolic event. Here, um, the publisher says, we will learn about the Prometheum idea initiated by Marshal Kuczowski and continuated today by President Kaczynski. So the quest for continuity uh, is at, the goal is achieved, the continuity is there. And here you can see how Russia is treated in this discourse. We will read about the Russian aggression against Georgia in 2008. So the Russian-Georgian war in 2008 is commonly called a, foreign, a Russian aggression. There is no other way um, to interpret or to talk and to make sense of this event. Only three um, more uh, textual examples taken from news. When the Soviet Russia decided to conquer Georgia in 1920, Poland was the only country that provided help. So th this is an exclusivity of this special relationship. Maybe it's even more special because we were the only country that provided help. The problem here is that in 1920, Poland was fighting, fighting its own war against the Soviet Union. In fact, the Red Army almost captured Warsaw. So what help was provided in 1920? This is a big question, uh, if there was any help provided. Uh, Poland took the officers from the Bankish Georgian army under its protection and then repaid this favor to their new fatherland. So uh, Poland is constructed as a new fatherland for Georgians. Um, and indeed, in the second citation, it says, Poland was the second fatherland. They fought in September 1939 in the home army, in the Warsaw Uprising, in Malta Castle and Kavli. So again, these are all symbolic events, very important for Polish national identities, that are taken and enriched by the Georgian element. Um, and here, uh, we also have a statement that Georgian officers paid for the Polish hospitality with their blood. And wherever you have such a lexicon, fatherland, soil, blood, it is clear that um, this is some kind of new national narration, narration, national identity being created here, but not for only one nation, for, the, for both of them at once at the same time. And I only want to show, show you here how Russia is treated within this discourse, because Russia is very important here. In 2008, when the uh, Russian-Georgian uh, war erupted, uh, these were the typical headlines in Poland. It says here, Russians, hands of Georgia. This one is much more brutal. It says, hands of Georgia in post soviet come. And um, th this was not uh, untypical, unfortunately. And what is Russia, in fact, doing in Georgia, according to Polish news materials? The mighty Russian army attacked Georgia and is bombing Georgian villages. So it is attacking civilians, it is attacking people. And Russian tanks entered South Ossetia a region captured by pro-Russian separatists which Georgia is now trying to recapture. Uh, of course, this is a translation, but in the Polish original, it really sounds like as if South Ossetia was a non-problematic region before. And this very day, some group of, uh, of South Ossetian separatists captured, captured it. And now uh, they, they are receiving help from the Russian side which is, of course, not the case, because South Ossetia was um, the back point <laughs> since the early 90s. But a um, Polish reader doesn't have to know it. So then he is served with this kind of information. And uh, what I want to claim at the end, what I want to suggest, this is not a claim, this is just a suggestion, that this whole discourse has a birthplace and a birthday. And this is the birthplace of this discourse. This is uh, what made possible this, this, all, this, all of these ways of making sense of Georgia and Poland. This is 
The 12th of August 2008, in the midst of the Russian Georgian War, when Polish President Kaczynski took part in a rally with some other presidents of Eastern European states, and he said, Today it is Georgia which is being attacked, and tomorrow the Baltic states, and later possibly Poland as well. We are here in order to fight, and this war rhetoric shocked many at this time, but it also fell um, on a very familiar ground of, of having to fight Russia. So, in fact, without Russia, there would be no Polish Georgian Brotherhood. There would be nothing to talk about today. Thank you very much. <laughs> interesting presentation. Can you just add some more details like the, the others are interested as well in things like when would you say this whole thing started? Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any pre precedents from before like, uh, 1989 or mm -hmm. did it escalate just with the Kaczynski brothers? Uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing is how much does it different, differentiate, how much is it divisive within the Polish uh, political life? I guess this is quite a right wing thing. Mm -hmm. And would it be identi is it identified mainly or exclusively with the right wing uh, no, or is it not. not? And would uh, ironizing about these claims of brotherhood would be read as uh, extremely leftist or very strange claims or is it normal let's say so for for the leftist to, to contest. I understand that you think um, that this is a right-wing discourse, but in the case of Poland it is not. It is um, the dominant discourse everywhere. Because uh, I deal with materials uh, from newspapers and news outlets of all the ideological um, orientations in order to see what happens, whether there are some changes or differences. And in fact, I see no differences. This is absolutely the dominating narrative. And uh, this photo that I showed you that is ridiculing the whole thing, this was the only example of something that I would call anti-discourse that I have found so far. Of course, I am at the beginning of my research, my first year, so I have four more years to go and maybe I will find something more. But as now for Poland, this is absolutely the, the dominating discourse. And it is a performative one because I think it it claimed it is claimed that this exists and then it really comes to existence. These these associations uh, they are there are more and more. And what was the other questions? I'm I'm sorry. I, no. Did any of this happen ah, after no. uh, the, 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 the interesting thing before. about it that it is that Georgia was absolutely absent from the public discourse. Because uh, in the 90s, Poland was a country that was undergoing transformation. There was this European Union, inflation, economic problems, blah, blah, blah. So Georgia was absolutely absent from the discourse. And it was very sudden. And this is why I would suggest that it has a birthplace and a birth date. Yeah, I was just wondering about this idea of a birthplace of the discourse and the origin of the discourse and name it. I mean, I would call it a discourse of event, but even if this politician voices it, it has, must be in his mind before. So the yes, discourse um, must have existed somehow. So. Yes, it existed um, as, in fact, um, as a part of the foreign policy of this uh, particular political party, uh, of, of the twin brothers. So then there is like a lower discourse or like a subterranean discourse became maybe public or official? Yes, like it was old. absolutely marginal, yes, but when they came to power, it spread everywhere. And they are, excuse me, they are no, no, no more in power, now they are opposition, but it continues to, you know, it lives its own life. So I would just not call it the origin of the discourse, but maybe a turning point in the discourse. Or... Maybe you're right, I just wanted to use such, you know, Something that speaks. Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> maybe to maybe say a little bit more about the context and context of this debate. Of course, I was talking about oh, is this 
discourse and supposition also connected to, for example, economic issues, or is it just a political and foreign policy question? I do not see uh, so far any economic uh, questions, issues here. This is uh, highly ideological and politicized. And uh, as I'm, uh, I'm saying, there would be, I wouldn't be speaking about it if there was not for Russia. If this was not, I, I don't think this would exist in such a way. Um, yes, I have a small question about the, the family metaphors, uh, like, the, uh, uh, like the Poland and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Georgia in the brothers. Yes, brothers. Um, because um, I saw another presentation two, two years ago, I think, about Ukraine. Uh, and there in the pro-Russian discourse, there was also the imagination of the Russia being the big brother, I think. Mm -hmm. of, uh, and I think I've read somewhere else that apparently during Soviet times there was also this, this metaphor for Poland. Like a lot of Soviet states saw so Russia as a big brother, basically. Um, so the Poland was not uh, part of Soviet Union. Poland yeah, was only exactly. Eastern Bloc. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, but in the sphere of influence. Of course, I know. Um, and um, I was wondering um, if that's the case, I don't know if it is, but like there has been a reconfiguration of family relations. Uh, well, if, if we want to call it reconfiguration, yes, of course, because now Poland and Georgia are the little brothers, mm -hmm. and Russia is the big brother. But is it still, is Russia also being followed in terms of family relations still? Uh, not really. It is not another So we are supposed to have a break right now, and we will be back at 6:30.